Hello, Hello Internet. Internet. I am Jeff Petriello, aka the Beth, and you are watching me at the Now This News Studio in Midtown Manhattan. And I am joined today by the lovely Katie Quinn, you may recognize from our videos. Hello. And our guest, our guest of, of honor today, Cat George, George, author, blogger, and internet superstar. Um, so they, so they, these, these ladies got their lower and sword, 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 um, but you can, um, you can see their Twitter, Twitter handles, handles are there, there yeah. at, at cat underscore George, and, and at Katie. Katie. And the and hashtag, hashtag, hashtag for today's, today's hangout, hangout is, is hashtag, hashtag NT pink pink fifth. Fit. So, so feel free, feel free to, to hashtag, hashtag on, on Twitter, Twitter, or we have a post on the Now is News Facebook as well as, well as the plus, plus, so, so everyone every watching, I am going to be monitoring those feeds and happy to bring in your questions, uh, if, there if there aren't any. Um, but let's, let's get started, started at least with, with some introductions. introductions. Maybe, uh, Katie, you want to introduce, introduce who you are, and then we can pass along to Kat who maybe you are, and then we can pass along to Kat um, who maybe can tell us what we're talking um, about today, which is her what wonderful we're talking new about e-book, which has been out for a week, which has been out for a week, I believe, now. Thought catalog, the, uh, and, uh, thought catalog and maybe give us and a little brief description of what it's about. Description of what it's about in uh, case people who are uh, watching, uh, people who are watching do not know. Right, so, right, right. so I am Katie Quinn. I'm one of the VJs for Now This News. Um, kind of covering everything there is to cover, from news to food and entertainment. And I recently read Cat George's book Pink Bits and uh, could not put it down. Literally stayed up past my bedtime to finish it. So um, at that, I'll hand it over to Kat to tell her a little bit more about herself. Um, hello, hi. I'm Australian, not British. Just thought I was clear. <laughs> anyway. um, I'm a writer living in New York City, and um, as you've already been told by uh, the lovely Katie and Jeff, I um, I wrote a book called Pink Bits, and it's available now on Kindle. It will be out in a hard cover format eventually. Um, but for now, you can buy it. It's two ninety nine. I wrote it about um, pink bits, I guess. Um, and you can be really creative with your interpretation of that. Um, it's about growing up with. Uh, am I allowed to say vagina? Like, yeah, you can say whatever you want. Like swear? I mean, like, can I just drop all the genital? Yeah, you can drop all the genitals. I, I think. I think I'm gonna. This is gonna be just. You know, if you're squeamish about you know genital words and sex words, then you know. Pink Bits, hopefully, is the kind of book that will make you feel, you know, a little bit better about all that stuff as well, so. All right, great. So I think Katie had some basic uh, questions to start off with here, just to get a bit of an idea of the creation. Uh, yeah. yeah, so Kat, you've written a lot of articles for Vice magazine, and um, I've read quite a few of them, and they touch on similar things that you touch on in your book, so why did you decide to come out with a book now? Um, so, Thought Catalog kind of approached me with this when they started doing this amazing digital publishing um, thing and they were like, you know, I was actually out at drinks I think with Chris and we started talking about the books and we were like, you know what, I should do a book. I was like, I should do a book. Um, it's like a really great way to sort of consolidate everything that I've um, yeah, been been working towards, been writing about, um, and it's just yeah, it's been it's, it was a natural progression I think of um, that um, my body of work coming together in this like one more concise um, collection of essays. So speaking of your body of work and kind of you growing as a writer, have you always found the humor in the stuff that you are writing about? Because there were so many things that I was reading. It was like, yeah, yeah I've had such a similar experience. I'm not, I'm not sure, sure that, that I could frame it in, in the way that you do, where, where you can laugh, laugh about it, it and, and therefore, therefore learn something about it. So, so when did you start to find humor in these experiences? Well, you know, when I was 16, it definitely wasn't funny. Everything was very very serious. Um, you know, like accidentally farting during sex or something would have been the end of my life. Like, the end of my life. <laughs> I'd have been like mortified, embarrassed. I would have locked myself in a room for a week, and cried, I'd written about it in my journal, and you know, had all these 
really crazy existential feelings about it. And I guess you just kind of get to the point where you've had enough of these experiences and these things happen enough times and you hear about, you know, you go, go out with your girlfriends and you know, even your guy friends and everyone has these stories. These things have happened to everyone and, and they're not unique. And I think once you start realizing that they're not unique and you're, you know, you're able to sit at a bar and, and have a drink with your best friend and laugh about um, something absurd that happened to her in a sexual encounter with a guy or something that happened to me, it all just starts, you see, start to see just the ridiculousness of the situations that you're, I mean, when you think about it, sex is a really ridiculous thing. <laughs> it's two people who are like naked and rubbing their bits on each other and grunting and having weird like hormonal and physical reactions and it's it's the weirdest thing you do like people are more sort of embarrassed about dancing in a club than they are about rubbing their naked body against someone else's I just think it's, I think it's, it's so it's so absurd just the action of it but also awesome and amazing yeah completely and, and you brought up some Something um, that makes me want to actually throw a question over to Jeff because you talked about whenever you, you know, you're talking with your girlfriends and your guy friends, and everyone's like, yeah, we've totally had something like that, and you can all laugh about it. So, Jeff, what, as a, as a dude, what did you think while you were reading Pink Bets? Great question, Ken. Great question. <laughs> so, I actually loved reading this book because it was, you know, a kind of, um, an, a prolonged uh, glance into Kat's um, perspective on sexuality and growing up in a different gendered body than I have, which is always, you know, kind of eye-opening and interesting. So I, I liked it because it was both relatable, um, but also, like, outside, obviously, my own experience. And... Uh, I think it, it's really easy for anybody to pick up, whether you're a guy or a girl, and get something out of it. And it's not exclusionary in any. In fact, I actually picked out one of my favorite things was when you were describing losing your virginity, which, uh, you know, and I'm I'm like a I'm a gay dude too, so I have I, I'm both not a woman and both not familiar with heterosexual sexual encounters to the extent that uh, the majority of the people who might be reading this book are. So, you know, I'm coming at them from a couple of different angles. But even I found it, like, really relatable. It was that just, like, awkward moment that everyone has, no matter, you know, who you are or who you're having sex with. Like, the first time is just never going to go as you planned. Hopefully it goes safely and, um, you know, in a non-abusive way, which glass of... Uh, which uh, gladly it happened to you. It sounded actually like the guy was amazing. He like hand washed your. <laughs> yeah, I'm like kind of jealous of your first boyfriend situation, actually. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was awesome. Him. I emailed What's him up? recently and I asked him if I could um, use his real name in, in the book. And he was just like, yeah. And I was like, you know you did nothing wrong. Otherwise, you would have said <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, well, that was great. I was happy for you there. But actually, there was, like, one thing when you compared it to the Indiana Jones ending um, from, I was thinking, it's the Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Yes. Um, and it was the end we were comparing, like, having sex, you thinking of grabbing, like, the uh, goblet that was, like, adorned in all of the gorgeous jewels and everything, but actually it wound up being more, like, uh, that's the thing that turns you to, to to stone or whatever it was. And the real great moment was the simpler, uh, you know, the carved uh, goblet, if you will. And, you know, I was obsessed with Ann Jones, and I feel like, you know, that was a really good... I got exactly what you meant. So you do a really good job of making it accessible to everybody, I guess, is where I'm getting at. So <laughs> you obviously talk about things that... Um, some people may consider taboo. Um, do you ever feel like you're pushing boundaries, or does it just feel like, man, I'm just saying, just saying what's on my mind? Or do you literally have to think before you like press the enter key on something? You're like, oh, I'm just gonna do it. Um, I, ne I never, fe I never feel like the content of what I'm actually saying is pushing boundaries. I think it's all been said before um, in different words. Obviously, I'm from a different perspective. 
But I do think that, and I do definitely feel that being um, a young woman writing about these things is pushing some boundaries. And I get that a lot in that, you know, some of the reactions I get, some of the commenters I get online, some people who tweet at me, and it's people, um, yeah, don't, still don't yet take women uh, seriously when they're talking about or comfortable with sex because um, at the same time as um, I'm, very, I'm very open to talking about um, sex in my writing and, you know, all these sorts of um, things that maybe don't make polite table conversation with your grandparents, um, at the same time, I don't think that I'm really ever saying anything like too like. I'm not like yeah, I went to this like, which you know I have no problem with, and if you want to do this, like completely fine, as long as again you're doing it safely and with consent, it's fine. But I'm never like oh, I went to an orgy with like 16 men, and there was like autoerotic asphyxiation and bestiality, and like actually bestiality is bad. Um, but, you know, <laughs> like. Um, I don't think that I'm necessarily um, excessively outgoing or I have any very particularly strange proclivities, but at the same time, even having these like very basic sexual desires and talking about sex in such a practical way, people are still, uh, still have, some people still struggle to accept it coming and to take me seriously, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a female from a female perspective. Right, and the only way to combat that is to continue doing it. Oh, yeah, right. hell no. Yeah, not going to yeah. shout <laughs> <laughs> Just keep on keeping on. Wait, so have your, you, you do give a shout out to your parents in the book. Have they read it? Oh, this is interesting because I actually Skyped with both of them on Saturday and <laughs> my mom hasn't read it. Um, she doesn't know if she's going to. My stepdad actually reads everything that I write and uh, is my biggest fan and he's very, I mean he never brings it up um, but he does, I know he does assure my mum that it's not as graphic and you know uh, salacious as she maybe thinks it is. My dad on the other hand asks, asked me, he said you know do you want me to read this book and you know there's part of me that does because I'm really proud of it and I'm really proud of what I've achieved. There's another part of me that doesn't want my dad to know. There's like a 16 year old in me that still doesn't want my dad to know that he was like picking me up from my boyfriend's house right after I just like being covered in honey giving him blowjobs. <laughs> there's part of me that just doesn't want my dad to like, ever, ever know I feel that. that. I feel that. <laughs> that's, that's understandable. Same. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, actually, one of the things I was going to say is I found it really, uh, really funny in your book. A lot of the titles of the chapters are extremely attention getting. We can go through some of them here, like um, what we mean when we talk about blowjobs, how to pop a cherry, would you like me better if I fucked you? Um, and so <laughs> you're always kind of like brought into this, you're like, what is going to happen? And then you do kind of always come at those attention credit getting uh, topics with a much more like approachable and kind of anecdotal tone than uh, something that, that you might expect with a title like that. So how do you go about, you know, deciding that you were going to have that kind of like grabby title, uh, you know, structure? Um, I guess that was just a sort of like a natural progression of the way that I write for Thought Catalog and I mean, there's a lot of, uh, the wonderful thing about Thought Catalog, I guess, and being a contributor, and you know, I used to be an editor there as well um, in 2011. Um, I think one of the great things is, you know, the creative liberty that they sort of let you have there. And I mean, they, they have a really great editing process as well, but um, because I think I've been with them for so long, I've got that, like, the format down and you know it's all sort of about making people you know it's sort of like I think it's like a real digital thing that you start to and you guys probably understand that you start to learn as a skill is how to you know yeah bring make people read what you're writing yeah <laughs> um, and you know it's not about being misleading it's definitely about just putting 
in the, for me, the brashest sort of terms possible, what's coming next. Yeah. Um, yeah um, so we actually have a bunch of questions coming in on Twitter, um, and I want to pose one for you now if we can. Uh, the first comes from uh, Lainey Frost, who's actually one of our producers here, and she said, can you ask if the author has even um, come across someone who is offended by the book title? Because we were talking about people can be offended by the wackest shit, so uh, has that run across your um, I haven't come across anyone who's offended by it. I um, did meet someone recently at a friend's going away drinks, a young man who I think it made him really nervous. He loved, he must have been, I mean, because it was my friend's little brother's going away and he's 21, so this kid must have been 21 as well. And he was, he just loved uncontrollably when I told him the title of the book. He was, and he was like, oh my god, really, really? Oh, like hysterically laughing. And I, I figured that he just, I don't think he was offended, but I think it definitely made him a little bit uncomfortable or, or nervous. But yeah, offense, no, I, I'm sure there is someone out there who's definitely offended. I mean, I'm in a, a country where, um, you know, people are easily offended by vaginas. So, yeah, I can imagine that there's probably someone out there who's, um, Cursing me. Yeah, um, um, we actually have another one that was related to what we were talking about earlier, which is uh, ask Kat if she has any advice for a dude who wants to read the book without blushing. Um, don't be a prude. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty right. <laughs> yeah, just, just go into it with an open mind, and um, you know, there's so much in in the media and popular culture that is. You know, you grow up and you see movies like American Pie and male genitalia and just male sexuality is so, like, you know, heterosexual male sexuality is so accepted and it's so, you expect to see a teenage boy masturbating in a movie and you expect to see guys taking all their clothes off and you expect these things from men and I think that we should start accepting, you know, expecting them from women, young women too because we're all going through the same, I mean, you're just so hormonally charged when you're young and it would be nice if young women could feel that that was as acceptable and if and young men could feel like it was as acceptable for women to be sexual beings as well. So yeah, don't blush. We're all, you know, we all just want to take our clothes on. There, there's another young woman out there who I would say feels a similar way that you do. Her name is Lena Dunham. You may have heard of her. Um, are you a fan of girls on HBO or do you, what do you think of what Lena Dunham's doing in that world? I think I, I like to keep Lena Dunham and girls separate in my, in my head. Mm. Um, I love, I think Lena Dunham is, um, and I, I, you know, people always bring this up as well and I think that that's something that we need to sort of challenge is why we're going to relate to all young women in comedy to Lena Dunham now. Um, but aside from that, I think that Lena Dunham is exceptional. I think she's hardworking and talented and deeply intelligent. And to listen to her speak um, or read, you know, some of her anecdotal stuff, she's just an amazing, inspiring person. Girls, on the other hand, is a very different um, portrays a very different world than the one that I know. And um, I, you know, I've, I've enjoyed some episodes, and I definitely enjoyed the first season. Um, I do have certain criticisms of it, but overall, I, I think that what Lena's doing is fantastic. Um, y your chapter about um, having HPV and everything that kind of happened uh, after that, I, I didn't realize the reality of that, the, the medical procedures and everything that happened in that way. But then you talk about how as horrible and painful as it was, it made you kind of appreciate um, your own physicality. So can you talk about that a little bit more and how like day to day, how did that experience change the way you look at yourself? Well, I think HPV is a very interesting thing because not very many people know a lot about it. And um, most people have it. A lot of men are walking around just 
carrying this illness inside them that will never affect them, but that they can, you know, pass on indefinitely, um, and that can cause cervical cancer, which up until recently was the leading cause of death in American women. Um, and now, now I sound like a like a doctor or something. Um, <laughs> and I'm like doing some like infomercial about HPV, but no, I, it means a lot to me. And yet, in in the day to day, it's it's interesting to me because, um, you know, one minute I was sort of walking around thinking that I was fine and that nothing could could hurt me, and then um, a puppy big dogs, which terrify me, um, but. You know, I never thought of it coming from, in, you know, the threat coming from in, inside my body. And, you know, it does. And then one day it all changes and someone says to you, hey, you've got this thing, you're carrying around this thing inside you now that is never going to go away. It's always going to be part of you. It's always going to be there. And, you know, it regresses and maybe it will never have adverse effects on your cervix or your health. But it will be there. It will always be there. So it progressed really fast for me. I went from a clean bill of health to having like stage four um, cells, which is like right before getting cancer. Yeah, that's, t basically. that's terrifying news. <laughs> and that happened in six months. So I mean, when you're when you sort of have that like extra awareness that everything could just change in this small amount of time, it really becomes a bit. Everything becomes, at the risk of sounding like I've gone all Zen or yoga or something, everything, like, you're so much more aware of small changes in your body. And, you know, if my period, oh God, this is like way too much information, but if, if, like, my period comes like a day late now, I start stressing out. I start worrying, do I need to go have a pap test? So you become, like, very in tune with everything, and everything becomes very important, and just looking after yourself becomes more important. Do you think it, as a writer who tackles issues of sexuality and, and sexual physicality, do you have a responsibility um, to address public health issues or do you think those are two separate different realms? I don't think I have a responsibility to, but I would like to. Um, okay. It's important to me. So it's definitely something that I want to keep in the, my dialogue and the stories that I'm telling. Um, but yeah, I don't think it, I don't think anyone has a responsibility to do anything except for be kind to people. I can I can totally get that. Yeah. <laughs> mean people suck. Yeah, <laughs> mean people do suck. I want to go quickly back, and this is kind of this isn't about Lena Dunham, but piggybacking off of it a little bit. She's American. You're Australian. Do you, what what kind of is there a difference? For you being an Australian, in terms of how people see this stuff, like, is it different in Australia? Or are we bigger prudes here in the states? Or definitely, a hundred percent. I well, so I come from a Greek family as well. I'm um, first the first person born, I think, in my family um, in Australia. And on top of that, um, I'm all, I've also grown up in Australia and. There is conservatism in Australia, 100% for sure. Um, but overall, I think that the way I grew up was fairly open. There was like a, an open dialogue in my family about our bodies. And definitely having lived, I lived in London briefly, and definitely being in the UK, no one is a prude. I mean, people are dropping the C word into... I'm not going to say it because I know Americans hate it. Um, into you could say it if you want. <laughs> into a normal sentence, like "Oh, the cunting freezer is broken," like this, like you know, like the way we say "fuck" or "shit" or "dick." Yeah, yeah. They're they're using this word, and no one thinks twice about it. And you come to America, and you have to be so, especially in New like I mean, New Yorkers think that they're all liberal and <laughs> you know, but no, you have to be so politically correct here it's really hard sometimes because some of the funniest jokes are often you know dick jokes <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's, that's sure. accurate yeah <laughs> have you run up into a situation in new york where you've said something politically insensitive if you so put it so many <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's not just it's yes yeah, so many. it's it's really tough sometimes people just look at me like what the fuck is this girl on 
Um, I yeah, I have I have barely no filter as well, so it's it can be difficult. But you know, the right people understand. Americans also have a problem. No offense, with sarcasm, unless they're Jewish. Um, I I find <laughs> Jewish people are the only people that understand sarcasm mm -hmm. for some reason. Everyone else thinks I'm being real serious <laughs> all the time, but I'm not. <laughs> That's well, we have a uh, couple more Twitter questions here. Yeah. Um, do you think sexism is more rampant with the advent of the internet or just more transparent? Parent? Oh, it's definitely just more in your face. There's like, I mean, you know, in some ways we live in a less sexist world now than we ever have and in other ways we have more of the opportunity to be, not we, not me and you guys, but generally as a society there are more opportunities to be sexist. So. There are more opportunities to start a creep shots page on Reddit, um, whereas that didn't used to exist. It doesn't. I don't think it means that there's more sexism. I think it's just more well documented sexism. Yeah, for sure. Did you have it? Was there another? Yeah, question? Yeah, we also have one. Um, will there ever, related? Will there ever be an end to slut shaming on Twitter? You know, not anytime soon. Not anytime I, soon. I think it's a fair answer. I would like there to be one day. A hundred percent. I don't I don't know that there'll ever be an end to any kind of shaming. People really like judging each other. People love that. Um, it's absurd and unnecessary. Um, sleeping a woman who sleeps with many men isn't hurting anyone. I mean, unless she's knowingly passing on an STD, or she's killing the men straight after she has sex with them, or you know, robbing them. <laughs> no one's getting hurt here. Um, and I think that in all situations, when you're, a, and, and instead of being politically correct and asking what is politically correct, I think people should start asking: Has anyone been hurt in this situation? And if no one's been hurt, then I think we're doing just fine. Well, I think, what's your concept of hurt there, though? Because some people would say, you know, and a lot of these arguments start with, like, you, yeah, even on the internet, it's like, you offended me just by, like, saying that thing, you know? So, like, there's obviously no physical harm being there, but you, you're never aware of, like, what thing, you know, trigger there's, alert. There's you know. a difference between having a critical opinion and hate speech as well. Yeah. The, di there's a difference between saying, you're a fucking slut, um, you deserve to be raped, which I am sure a lot of people say a lot on the internet, um, and what happened to Lindy West actually springs to mind straight away recently was all, like disgraceful. There's a difference between that and saying, hey listen, I think maybe you're putting your body at risk and by doing this, and you know, I, I am worried about you, but you know, if it's what you're going to do, then it's what you're going to do. You you can you can have an opinion. You can think that sluts are the worst. You know, you can hate sluts. You can like just want to never look at a slut or all the sluts to die. Just maybe be a little bit measured about expressing that to people because at the end of the day, it it just pays to realize that you're, no one's perfect and. Your opinions of people are just opinions of people, and you can express them in a more generous way than to attack them. That's what I think. Totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree too. I mean, I to discuss with someone why they think that um, having a lot of sex is a bad idea. I, I yeah, I also was just gonna say that like the word "slut" is so completely subjective, like. Oh, you slept with someone before you're married. You're a slut. You know, like in, it just depends. Like some people, their definitions are so vastly different. It's like, what exactly is this? It's whatever you can get it is probably in your head. I was just saying to my brother recently when I was in Australia. Um, he was, well, he's 19, and I just remember saying to him, like, what did he called a, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Peter. Um, he called a girl a slut in his grade, and I was like, what, like. What is a what does that mean? What is that? What is a slut? Who defines what a slut is? Uh, and 
And why? Why does it matter? More importantly, why does it matter what a slut is? It, it, it shouldn't, and I don't want it to, and I hope that one day it means absolutely nothing. But this is why every guy has to have an older sister to, uh, to, <laughs> to point that out. That would be great. <laughs> um, we have another one coming in from a dude. Um, can a man be a feminist? If so, how? If not, why not? Of course a man can be a feminist. That's like saying can, um, I don't know, like, can a woman play football? Yes. Like, anyone can be whatever they want to be. And the best way to be a male, and you know, my, actually, I think that my favorite feminist is a man. It's uh, <laughs> Joss Whedon, who oh I... Oh my God. Best <laughs> human. <laughs> he, he, he's the, for me, growing up, he defined, he was like the feminist voice for my generation. But All right, he, so can we geek out here for a second? Yeah. Because I was watching Choices, <laughs> season three of episode uh, 19 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer last night, and was like, this show, everything. But it's really true. And I think actually, as a young um, questioning male, when I was young, um, you know, I didn't really come to a knowledge of my sexuality until much later after the um, show had ended already. But, um, you know, even just watching the strength of his female characters, which I think he carries through in almost every single one of his series, like, yeah. and even in the comic books, I don't know if you've read any of them, but, like, you're totally right. Like, that is, it was inspiring, and I think, it's just a proof, to go back to the question, you don't need to be a woman to be a feminist or to include these kind of ideas in this, in your creative work. Um, but it was like so inspiring to me. It really informs the way I look at so much other fiction and art that I'm looking at. And uh, I don't know, what was your experience? Well, I do happen, I, I happen to think that Buffy is the greatest feminist text of my generation and I think that if, yes. if you're watching this and you're a feminist or you consider yourself a feminist or you care about um, women's representations in the media it is a hundred percent you should just it's on Netflix just get on there and sit, spend your weekend watching Buffy back to front because there's there's just nothing like it and growing up it was a really it was just really wonderful to have this woman in front of me that wasn't any less of a woman because she was strong and yes. um, that goes across the board for all of Joss Whedon's characters and all the characters on Buffy is that they all exist in this grey area between good and bad and between soft and hard and between, you know, good and evil and straight and gay and um, I don't want to spoil anything for anyone but if you read ahead, um, read the, as you mentioned, the comics, it's really interesting to see Buffy um, even exploring that yeah, notion of sexuality and you know where her sexuality lies. I don't want to say too much because what if someone's reading yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> spoiler season eight. Um, but but yeah, I, I definitely think men. Hundred percent. Joss Whedon is a staunch feminist. That he's a man who, and this is what is so interesting to me about him is he's a man who writes and directs and depicts women the way that women want to be perceived. And that's yeah, I mean, I just remember like watching certain scenes where here you have this woman who literally can save the world. Like yeah. she's imbued with power. Every scene has power, um, and she'll just cry yeah. <laughs> about like her boyfriend yeah. <laughs> like turning her back and uh, turning his back and running away. And I'm like, yes, because that is the way you know. Like I want to feel. I want to have that power, and I yeah. I want to still you know yeah. feel the things I feel. Joss Whedon said the most amazing thing recently. You know, he did, he did some speech at um, a college recently. I can't remember where. Anyway, and he said, don't just be yourself. Be all yourselves. And that's really beautiful to me because um, so often women are expected to be one thing or another or, you know, if you're bossy, you're a bitch. If you're um, a housewife, you've given up. Um, you know, when it's so hard to, like, pick a thing because then people are like, oh, but you're not all the other things. Yeah. And when you are all the things, then you're crazy or you're 
doing to you know there's there, you can't win when you're a woman um, sometimes it's just like everyone is looking for something to criticize and I think that that's really important I think it's really important to accept that yes women are mothers and women can be housekeepers I, I can't wait to be a mummy like I want babies in me and I want to cook for my family and I want to raise my children but that doesn't mean I don't want to fight the bad guys too and it doesn't mean that I don't want to be the breadwinner and that I don't want to write 10 New York Times best-selling books um, I want to do all those things and I don't think that I think that, that the best actually best way for a man to be a feminist is to not question that yeah Kat, who are some of the other women who you really admire, um, writers or otherwise? That's a good question. My favorite person in the world at the moment is Britt Marling, who is exceptional. She's an exceptional writer and an exceptional actress. And I actually recently wrote an article about her for Bullet magazine, if anyone is interested in oh, reading yes. that. It's great. Um, <laughs> I, as she's writing women in a way that I've never seen women, women written before. She's writing um, thrillers, basically, starring women as humans. You know, they're not these, like, sexy power rangers and they're not, you know, weak and needing assistance. They're just as sort of thrifty and innovative and hard and emotional as, you know, John McClane um, in Die Hard, you know? She, The East is a, a brilliant movie um, that shows, I mean, her and Patricia Clarkson and Alan Page are the three leading women of a film that traditionally is a film that would have been written for men. And it's written almost exactly the same as it would have been written for a man. And I think that that's absolutely, like, just so inspiring. But, um, you know, I love... Mindy Kaling. I love her. Um, I'm obsessed with the Mindy Project. <laughs> I love yeah. Elizabeth Merriweather, <laughs> um, who writes New Girl. Um, New Girl's my favorite show at the moment. I love um, Leslie Headland, who wrote The Bachelorette. I love The Bachelorette. Um, the movie? Not the show. Oh, is, was that the one with Kirsten <laughs> Dunst? Yeah, uh, Kristen Dunst and Isla Fisher and Rebel Wilson and Lizzie Kaplan. Lizzie Kaplan, I love Lizzie Kaplan. Um, there's a lot of women. I mean, I fell in love with Jane Austen and Emily Bronte when I was, like, 14 and Edith Wharton. I love um, those feminist writers from, you know, period feminist writers. They, to me, um, you know, and I often say this, I love Katy Perry. And I think Katy Perry is a modern Jane Austen. I think that... Explain. Yeah. <laughs> Jane Austen fooled a generation of people into reading feminist texts on the pretense that they were romantic novels, they were rom-coms. And I think that Katy Perry, and actually not just Katy Perry, there are several artists like her, Kesha, whose music I don't like. Which Obsessed I'm obsessed with Kesha. <laughs> But there are these I was women now. cutting myself dancing to crazy kids <laughs> I like the that entire weekend. Actually, the one about the kids and like a bit to the Illuminati hand. Um, but yeah, these there's these women who are tricking, well not tricking, but they're feeding this message of female empowerment without actually, I because I think you can really turn off people who aren't already on the feminist page. You can turn them off by saying, hey, look at all this feminist shit. Like, I'm so empowered. But if you just are, if you just act, in a way, you're still, you know, putting this message out there. And to me, I think that Katy Perry is one of those people who appeals to a very young audience. And she's a really strong, strong character. She's a woman who just didn't take no. She was just rejected from, you know, record company after record company. They told her, I kissed a girl wasn't going to be a hit. And she just wouldn't, she just didn't, and just never said die. Like, that's really, for a woman, that's a hard thing to do, especially in a male industry. Yeah, for sure. I think I'll listen to a Katy Perry song a little differently next time yeah. it comes up. Yeah. Um, I think this is a pretty cool question coming in on Twitter here. Um, who did you? It's kind of basic, but we haven't addressed it. Who did you imagine as your target audience when you were writing Pink Boots? Predominantly, um, young women, so teenage girls and women in their twenties. But that being said, I think that it's also a great book for men. Um, I think that it's 
you know, it's important for dudes to know the kind of stuff that women go through too um, because they don't. Um, and I, I definitely think it's a great book for parents. Um, I think it's, you know, all kids like sort of go through this stuff and I, I guess there's a lot of space between, and my mum always used to say to me when I was growing up and wanting to kiss boys and go to parties, she would say, you know, I was a teenager too. I went through this too. I know what it's like. And no, you cannot go to the party. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a nice reminder to parents as well that, yeah, it, it is scary and it's scary for everyone. It's not just scary for the parents to think of their, their girls, you know, out there having these experiences and going through these things, but that it's okay and that we do sort of all have to go through them on our own and that they're not, hopefully, hopefully they're not life-destroying experiences and that is part of who we are and part of what makes us strong young women. I mean, do you think that there is a way that parents can help young girls through this time or just to kind of stay out of the way while we experience these things? You can't tell teenage girls anything, man. Like, I remember when I was a kid, I just didn't, I knew everything. Like, I knew everything. Like, there's nothing you can tell me, and I was like, Kanye West can't tell me nothing. Like, I knew how the world worked, I knew what I wanted, and no one was going to tell me any different. I think what, um, what, and I think what I've said to my mom is that you thought I wasn't listening, but all the lessons you sort of tried to impart on me when I was, you know, running upstairs and slamming doors and locking myself in my room, um, all the things you said I remember now and I repeat them. So just do what you, I think the parents just need to sort of like do what they're doing to be a really great parent and just try not to be disheartened by the fact that it seems like their kids just don't give a fuck because really it is, it's sinking in. Like it's, it does, it sinks in. It does. Yeah. I would, I would, I would agree with you on that fully. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to your book really quickly. Yeah. So it just, just came out a week ago, right? Yeah. Um, and tell me a little bit about the e-publishing world. I have to admit that your book was one of the, it, one of the first books I've re read all the way through on an e-book. Um, it's so interesting. Um, it's so interesting because anyone can do it. And this is like the democratization of um, creativity, I, I guess to an extent. Anyone can write a book now. Anyone can put, you don't need an agent. You don't need, like, I mean, it's great to have an agent, obviously, if you want to do other things outside the internet. Um, but the internet is sort of your DIY, just DIY, isn't it? You just do whatever you want. And what Thought Catalog is doing is absolutely amazing because they've, yeah, they've just taken out the need for a middleman. And you can now publish a book with a great respected publisher behind you. Thought kind of the name of Thought Catalog is, you know, I mean, it's ubiquitous. It's they're everywhere and everyone knows what that means and everyone knows that they're important and they've, you know, really captured a moment. And that's a wonderful thing, um, what they're doing. And I think I haven't seen any other publications quite approach publishing in the same way. Um, and it's it's really exciting. It's terrifying as well because you just don't know. Um, you just don't know how it's going to go. There's no guarantees. So yeah, with yeah, I was actually going to say. Um, so after it's been a work week now, could you reflect a little bit on what that week has been like, and maybe uh, let us know if you would do anything different next time or. Um. No, you know, next time I think I'd like to spend a little bit longer on the book. Um, if I were, if I were to go back, I would have tried to take. I wrote it in six weeks, so I would maybe like to take more time with it. Um, that's about it. And there's nothing you can't, you don't know. Once you put something out onto the internet, you can hope. You just hope for the best. Like. Yeah. <laughs> that's, did that's, you so did you have in this process did you have like an editor going through or was it like those six weeks and what you had is is well, what I read there was no we, we sent it back and forth a few times um, the editor however in this situation isn't like a traditional editor 
So when you're writing a, a real, not a, not a, this is a real book. Um, when you're writing a, a physical book, I guess your editor gives you creative advice and says, no, this chapter's not working, or yes, this paragraph's great, but you know, you need to expand on this idea. We didn't have that. We just had like a very grammar's off, or this word needs to change, or Americans won't understand what you mean with this word. It wasn't like a creative editorial process. It was just more of a practical one. So would what's the response that you've gotten from people about in, in this week? Um, it's been so overwhelmingly amazing. Um, actually getting, just getting this, these like and emails from uh, especially women who have read it and saying that they related and that it made them feel better. Um, I mean, that is really just, like that's, it's worth it to me. I mean, I could make one dollar and it would be worth it because... Yeah, that's the tops, right? That, it, how can you beat that? It's like, you know, and it, it hasn't been, it's not like a, a hundred people or anything like that, but everyone who reaches out to me and, and says, wow, I went through the exact same thing, or I feel less embarrassed now, or, you know, you've given me the confidence to do this. That's just the, like, I don't know if there's, maybe when I give birth that will be a really good feeling too, but like, this, there's no, or oh, go to a Katy Perry concert. This is like the best, <laughs> best feeling. Like it's such a great, it's an awesome feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next for you? Um, so what's next is so much thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm currently working on producing a pilot for a web series. Um, we're shooting in like two weeks and that's really, really stressful. Um, because there's so much to do. Like, I've never, it's the first script that I ever wrote. I've never been involved in, like, film production before. I'm, like, trying to write a shot list, and I'm trying to learn myself from Google all the sort of um, abbreviations you use and what everything means and, um, like, the anatomy of filming something. Well, there's these things that you just don't even think of as part of the process. So I just thought, yeah, I'll write this, and then we'll get a camera and a cast, and it'll be great. But no, there's like a lot of things here. Actually, yeah. no. Actually. I, I wound up being in video because I wanted to write a script after I graduated. And I literally started writing it. I was like, I feel like such an asshole. <laughs> I have no idea how this actually becomes something real. So I started working for free. Next thing you know, I was like in it. So I feel you on that one. Well, yeah, with, with the power of Google is that you can just figure out how to do everything. Um, and that's sort of what I'm doing. I'm figuring out how to do things. I'm actually working on a proposal for a hard physical book as well with my agent. Um, I'm writing still, so you guys can catch me, like Vice, Slow Catalog, Bullet, Noisy, um, Australian website called The Vine. Um, and what else am I doing? Just trying to figure shit out, I guess, like work out my life and what I want from it, and yeah, all the regular stuff that people are doing. For sure. All right, well, I think that's pretty much um, the questions that we had. Let me just double check if there's anything new that Twitter uh, has come No, we've asked most of them. So, yeah, if you have anything else to say, Kat, this is the time. Otherwise, we can be um, on our way. Thanks. Thanks, you guys, for this. Thank and you. Thanks to yeah, everyone let's just... who has read the book. Um, and it would be really great if um, you could tell it all your friends to read the book, too. <laughs> yeah, you guys can get it directly on the Thought Catalog uh, website. And it's available, I believe, on iTunes, Amazon, and the Nook, the Barnes & Noble store. And it's um, so... $99. It's a bargain. Um, yeah, it's totally worth it, and it's actually a really good holiday, like, summer beach read, for sure. Yeah, like, and it won't take you too long, and it definitely got jokes in, and references to vaginas, as you've probably figured out by now. But yeah, and, and just think, yeah, thanks to everyone who is awesomely following me and interested in what I have to say. Because that's, that's kind of cool that people, like, care. Well, count us among them. Thank now you. Now this news... Jeff Petrell, the Beth.
Hugh Katie, Katie Quinn, and Cat George. We had a lovely time, and hopefully you can join us for our next Hangout, or whoever it may be. Always, you can send in suggestions. We'll reach out to people, uh, and we'll be happy to have them on. Board. So thanks again, and uh, best of luck to you, Miss George. All right? Thank thanks you. for your wonderful book. It was a pleasure to talk to you, Cat. Thanks. Bye. Bye.